Welcome to Crash Course, the podcast about business, political, and social disruption, and what we can learn from it. I'm Tim O'Brien. Today's Crash Course, Black Voters versus the 2024 election. When last we visited, we talked about the central role Latino voters could play in the 2024 election. The same, of course, is true of the Black community. Joe Biden secured a victory in the Democratic primary in 2020 after Representative Jim Clyburn through his support and that of his Black constituents in South Carolina behind the candidate. Biden went on to take the presidency away from Donald Trump, and the pair now seems headed for a rematch. Black voters, and young Black voters in particular, appear to be much less enthusiastic about Biden these days. They're the most unenthusiastic they've been about a Democratic president in decades. Multiple polls suggest as much. Some of this is due to the Democratic Party deploying policy drive-bys during elections. Promises made are too frequently unkept. Black voters, who represent more than 12 percent of total eligible voters in the U.S., have come to expect it. Republicans have also intentionally thrown roadblocks in front of efforts to mobilize the full power of the Black vote. Think gerrymandering, voter ID laws, and the like. Most local legislatures won't be addressing it anytime soon, and the Supreme Court has empowered states to do as they please around voting access. Joining us today is Nia Malika Henderson, a political columnist for Bloomberg Opinion and a savant when it comes to decoding the forces (laughs) roiling the American political landscape. That was Nia laughing at my description of her. Because she just doesn't apparently know the high esteem in which I hold her. <laughs> this uh, is but great. you will too by the end of this conversation because she's a smarty. Hey, Nia. Hey there. I love that introduction. I've got to, I'm going to let my mom uh, hear this. I'll record it for her. Yeah. <laughs> so let's just jump into it. You know, in a very broad way, what's at stake for Black voters in this election? Well, listen, I think if you think about the state in which African Americans were living under a Trump presidency, the sort of psychic toll, the emotional toll of living in a country led by someone who really engages in the kind of bigotry and race baiting that he engaged in, you know, in the lead up to his election where he was talking about Barack Obama and the whole birtherism thing, and just the rhetoric he employed throughout his presidency, calling African nations shithole countries, and any number of incidents that just showed, I think, to African Americans, and listen, other groups as well, sort of gave a feeling that Black Americans were other, that he was perfectly fine using race and Blackness as a kind of wedge issue. So. That's part of the conversation that I think African-Americans are having. And part of the conversations that somebody like Jim Clyburn is having, too, is he goes around to African-American communities, particularly in South Carolina, and talks to them about white supremacy, about what it was like to live in a country that was led by Donald Trump. So that's sort of the sort of emotional toll that I think was at play in Trump's administration and is part of what I think people are calculating as they think about who they're going to vote for moving forward. Don't forget also when he was calling majority black countries shitholes, he was also making up new names for countries in Africa like Nambia, which doesn't exist. (laughs) Right, right. And he's never been very good at like finding things on maps, but but he was inventing, you know, African countries whole cloth, which was, I don't think any president has done that. I think that's right. And so you think about the assaults on democracy, the assaults on freedom, whether it's the literal assault on democracy that we saw on January 6th and just the continued undermining of institutions, and then issues like abortion, which get at sort of freedom and liberty. And so if you think about the way in which Biden, some of his surrogates, somebody like Vice President Harris is trying to frame these issues to African-American voters, it is about white supremacy. It is about the economy. It is about freedom. It is about this idea of do you want to return to the days of living in a country led by such an erratic, and some people would obviously say racist, president. Well, and we'll get into some of those issues, but I am perplexed, given that Trump is an overtly hostile person to people of color, right? and he doesn't really hide it, and he's also enabled other people to be openly hostile. Our civic dialogue has degraded it's translated into policy positions that 
I don't think are in the interests of communities of color. And yet all of the kind of polling around turnout suggests that a lot of black voters are thinking of just staying home, that they're not going to turn out. So you would think if Trump was that bleak of a prospect, that that would translate into more enthusiasm for Biden. And there's quite a bit. I think Biden got 92 percent of the black yes. vote in 2020, more or less, and, and mm-hmm. Trump got 8 percent. And it's still black voters prefer the Democratic Party. I've got no doubt that Biden will get a big majority of black voters again. But it's really important, actually, in swing states that black voters engage. And there appears, I think, and I'm always a little bit tentative with polls. Right. But it appears that there's this lack of enthusiasm. And I think that that could actually have a destructive impact on the interests of black voters if they don't turn out. So why is that? Why is there a lack of enthusiasm? Well, listen, I think there was never a huge enthusiasm for Biden, right? There was always an enthusiasm for kicking Trump out of office. We, of course, remember when it was finally declared that there was a President Biden and that he had won, there was dancing in the street, right? I mean, it was like a dictator had fallen. People were so kind of relieved to see him lose. And so you think about the polls now, and I think about Cornell Belcher, who's this great African-American pollster I'm sure you're familiar with. He is a pollster. He does focus groups. But he's also very mindful of the fact that the campaign has just begun, right? Campaigns are built to persuade voters, to make them enthusiastic, to give them a binary choice. And that is what's happening now. I talked to some folks at the Biden campaign. And listen, they are very aware of what the polls show now. They're very aware of what you mentioned, which is that historically it's been like souls to the polls, you know, the, the, a couple of weeks before November, not a lot of money put into GOTV efforts. And they're doing something very differently this go around. They're putting a lot of money in early and seeing those voters as voters they have to persuade and mobilize, not just the voters who are going to automatically show up. I will say this. I do think that the polling, and I hate to be sort of a polling truther, but the polling (laughs) has been really off in terms of African-American voters. And and off for quite a while. Yeah. Like, if you think about the lead up to 2020 to 2018, there's all these like, oh, my gosh, Republicans are going to get 20 percent of African-American voters. And it just it hasn't really materialized. I think there obviously has been a shift very, very minimally, but it is not as much as the polls suggest. But again, we talk about these swing states, places like Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arizona, those margins matter, right? Georgia. Yeah, exactly. All of this is going to matter. But listen, it's ramping up now. I'm actually going to South Carolina in the lead up to the Democratic primary where Biden, of course, will win. Kamala Harris will be there. She's going to an HBCU, South Carolina State in Orangeburg. And so it'll be interesting to see what her message is to those voters in particular, right? Young, educated African-American voters who have lots of discontent with Joe Biden. And again, they were never, you know, huge Joe Biden fans, right? There were Obamacrats, right? There is no parallel to that when it comes to Biden supporters. Older members of the African-American community love Biden. My mom is one of those folks. She's 86, 85, and she'll be pulling the lever for Joe Biden as well, all of her church friends. But then there is this other younger, more working class population of African-Americans that have some, you know, skepticism and they're going to need to be convinced and mobilized. And, you know, you just invoked the secret weapon of Barack Obama, right? which has not been activated yet by Democrats. And, (laughs) you know, marching Barack Obama with his myriad gifts as an orator and a truth teller and a very unusually charismatic politician in all those states, maybe he would campaign with Taylor Swift. (laughs) And you could just have like this twin engine, like a jet engine of voter enthusiasm push. So it'll be interesting to see how and when and where Obama gets activated, because I can't imagine he won't be. But I want to come back, and even within the flaw of the polls about the percentage of votes Republicans might or might not get, that data point concerns me less than turnout does. And I just want to turn to this in a second, because I think of 2016, right? Like... 
Obviously, Obama turned out black voters like no candidate has, I think, ever, at least since in the post-World War II era. And then in 2016, you know, black voters did not really turn out for Hillary Clinton. And you could pinpoint the states in which that created tipping points, Michigan, Wisconsin, et cetera, et cetera. I was in both states in 2020 talking to black voters. And one of the things that came up repeatedly in conversations I had with them is, you know, Hillary flew in here at the last minute. Like, she didn't come to Detroit until the last week of October or something like that. And they all said we just didn't feel... We felt taken for granted. And in fact, that's how her campaign rolled. They thought they were going to flip Texas, Georgia, and Florida, and they didn't campaign in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And I just, you know, this is possibly this election this year, the 2024 election, will turn on a knife's edge in terms of pluralities in a handful of states. And so I I wonder less about the total vote going to the Republicans and more about just people showing up for Democrats. I think it's a huge concern. Democrats obviously mindful of it. And sort of add to that, you do have Republicans campaigning for Black voters in a way that they haven't before. I mean, some of it is sort of cynical, and the ultimate goal is to have Black voters stay home, not necessarily vote for Republican candidates. But you do have some real efforts. I think it was Matt Gates, who I hate to quote, but here I am, said that, you know, for every maybe college-educated white person that a Republican might lose, they would gain a Jamal, or I think he said Jose. Because <laughs> he's such a sensitive person. Yes, exactly. And this is true, right? I mean, there is this resorting of the parties, right? And some of this is along class lines and some of it is along racial lines as well. Sort of the sorting, particularly among Hispanics, is much more noticeable going from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. It isn't as noticeable yet among African Americans, particularly African American working class men. But that is what's going on. And to me, I mean, sort of the argument that you hear Donald Trump making is one, I think, that is in some ways wrapped up in his masculinity, right, in his strength. He gave some speech recently where he was like, you know, a country needs a, a strong man. And I think he meant it in both ways, right? And that does, I think, resonate with young men, particularly young working class men, who have also been sort of told that their masculinity is, you know, under assault, that there's right. this sort of feminization. I mean, listen, if you watch ESPN, there are all these commercials about <laughs> this generation of men having the lowest testosterone ever. I wouldn't know. But, you know, those are the kinds of messages that I think could resonate with any number of groups and lead either to kind of low turnout among those groups for Democrats or actually some of these groups that have traditionally been voting for Democrats, voting for Republicans, particularly Donald Trump, not necessarily sort of down ballot, but just seeing in Donald Trump, somebody who they admire, the strength, the pretty wife, the beautiful kids, whatever it is, and obviously the billionaire status, right? I mean, that is also... Living the dream. Living exactly. the American dream. Yeah. Rolling like he wants to. His exactly. name's on the jet. Like all exactly. Stuff. Yeah. And, and, you know, I know you're a hip hop fan, Tim. And Donald <laughs> Trump was hugely popular in hip hop in the 90s and in 2000s, just as a symbol of bling and success and sort of a lavish life. And so some of that stuff still resonates. Yeah. Russell Simmons said to me once that he called Trump the bling bling white man. Yeah. And, you know, they were welcome at Mar-a-Lago and They'd be in the steam room and Donald would show up with a tray of orange juice in his red tie and blue suit, even in the oh steam room, God. even in the <laughs> steam room. But that's not a subject for our discussion today. Yeah. But, you know, it is interesting that that sector of the black community venerates him. But I think it's because of celebrity and wealth, right? It's not really about politics oh, or right. policy at all, but it's this image. And I think that has a lot of uh, traction with working class white voters, too. That's exactly right. I mean, this gets to the personality, the cult of personality built up around Donald Trump, which has been so effective. You know, the idea that he's a successful millionaire, a billionaire, excuse me. He's not, even though he probably is only just a millionaire. But listen, you know, this success of him and sort of the lavishness and the gold toilets and the supermodel wife, who isn't really a supermodel, nor does she speak seven languages, but never mind. But and she's only... an immigrant, by the way. We should yes. point out he, he married an immigrant. Yes, yes. Yeah. And some of them are nice people. Mm -hmm. But on this issue, again, of turnout, you know, just in the statistics, black voters, about 12 percent of eligible voters in 2020. They may be 14 percent in 24. White voters, 
are about 68% of eligible voters, but end up being 75% of the voters who cast ballots. Those numbers are always so fascinating to me because they speak to people's sense of how their vote empowers them or not. It sometimes pains me to see that the black community doesn't have as much faith in the power of their vote as clearly the white community does. I think we know the reasons for some of those things, but it's undoubtedly at work in this election, too. I think that's right. You think back to 2008 and all of the joy and pride among African Americans that the country had elected a black man, a black man named Barack Hussein Obama. And there was a lot of hope, right? There was some just silly hope about, you know, a post-racial America. But then there was real hope about conditions in Black communities being changed because of Obama being in office. And I think you look around and that didn't really happen, right? And even I think some of the discontent among, say, 30-something Black folks, 40-something Black folks, there is kind of looking back at Barack Obama with some disappointment, right? That we put so much, African Americans will say, into having him in office. But what do we get in return, right? And so then Hillary comes and obviously Trump gets in office and then Biden. And there's obviously some discontent, specific discontent, right, about promises not met, whether it's around voting rights or student loans. So, you know, and now I think a real sort of animating conversation for this group of voters, young African-Americans, is what's going on with the Palestinians. And the idea, you know, Joe Biden has gone to some events and there will be people and some of these are African-Americans who are standing up holding signs and calling him Genocide Joe. So this is a, you know, a real kind of animating force and animating conversation that's going on and not in a good way for Joe Biden's re-election prospects among young African-Americans. On that note, I want to take a quick break so we can hear from our sponsor, and then we will come right back to this conversation. I'm back with Nia Malika Henderson, a political columnist with Bloomberg Opinion. Nia, we were just talking about Black voters' disappointment with Biden, and I wanted to just dig into some of the highlight policy issues, the things that are most important to the black community. And from a policy perspective, the things that are fueling some of their disappointment, voting rights and the enforcement of voting rights and the access to the voting booth seems to me to be something well worth focusing on in this. But you can dissuade me if it's not. No, I think that's right. This is something that Joe Biden campaigned on. This is something that people believed that a, needed to get done and could get done, right? Particularly in the aftermath of George Floyd, right? You remember the sort of heady days of the racial reckoning and this idea that the country and companies wanted to get right in terms of race. And so what and happened- police reform. And police police reform. reform. I think that's exactly right. And so there were conversations around that. But one of the big hopes around that was that there would be some sort of voting rights bill. So there was one that went the Senate, it passed the House, and it failed, right? It failed the because of the Freedom Vote of, Act. That's right. And there was also the John L. Lewis voting. Yeah, there were two Act. separate ones, right? And ultimately failed because Democrats, two Democrats in particular, who I don't think will be in the Senate going forward, Kristen Sinema and uh, Joe Manchin, they were two. Are they really with Democrats? Them. Right, uh -huh. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, there's the idea that maybe they could scuttle the filibuster just for this bill to pass. And it turns out that they didn't want to do that. And of course, we know the filibuster has been used to scuttle lots of civil rights legislation historically. That's sort of the point of it. Yes. And so that history repeating itself. So sure, there's that lack of movement on that. And listen, you're going to hear from Biden on this again, right? You're going to hear from Kamala Harris on this again. I'm sure when there's another anniversary of the Bloody Sunday in March, right? They'll make a big deal about pushing for this and voting rights. But the fact of the matter is it didn't get done. Nothing really has been done on police reform. But done on issue. voting rights, does yeah. the Black community blame the Biden White House 
for not getting legislation through a Senate that has repeatedly torpedoed any legislation that would be helpful to Biden politically. We're in the middle of this right now on immigration. A bipartisan tax bill didn't get through. Chuck Grassley, an Iowa Republican, said, yeah, might be a good bill, but it would help Biden in the election. <laughs> right. So I just don't Quiet think there's any reason there. to do this. Yeah. 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 And, and voting rights. Are black voters seeing past the fact, and maybe the answer to this is obvious, but are they seeing past the fact that this is something they do and should care deeply about, and the fact that the White House might be sort of handcuffed because they have a recalcitrant Congress. Right. You know, listen, I think, sure. I mean, I think there is some recognition that there is a huge roadblock in the Republican Party in terms of advancing any number of, you know, Democratic causes, progressive causes. And that'll be part of what Biden talks about, right? And Harris talks about when they go before these audiences, when they talk about abortion, for instance, the idea that they need a more Democratic House and Democratic Senate. So send more Democrats and he can get things done. But there is, I think, and this isn't specific to the Black community, I think there is a sense among average voters that Presidents are sort of all powerful, right? It is the office that most people are familiar with. They don't necessarily pay attention who their local congressperson is or their senators. But there is a sense, I think, among just average voters that presidents, through their power of persuasion, and we voted for you, that you should be able to deliver on these issues. And if you don't, it is demoralizing. It could be a failing on your part. And it could mean that we stay home because. I haven't seen any deliverables for giving you my vote. So, you know, this is a conversation that is going to have to be had in all sorts of ways, sort of the traditional ways of campaigning, but then on Facebook and TikTok and the Gram and all of those social media platforms and The View and Charlemagne the God, places like that where African-Americans, particularly young African-Americans, are very tuned into those sites and those folks. You wrote a great column about Nikki Haley and her effort to sort of, I guess, disappear slavery as a factor in the Civil War. We are in the midst of this, I think, literal whitewashing of African-American history in the Civil War perpetrated by the Republicans and the right for political reasons. And white supremacy, white nationalism, racism and discrimination are also a paramount issue for the black community. Do black voters see Biden in light of all of that acting as a, you know, an agent of change and protection? You know, listen, I'm just going to be blunt here. Biden is 81, I think. He isn't someone I think that average black people, average people, right? look to as a pillar of strength. He's older, and some of that is literally his age, and some of that is probably just the burdens of the presidency and grief, quite frankly, because he's had so many losses in his life. I definitely think to a certain segment of African Americans, older African Americans, sort of the church-going set of African Americans, they see Biden not necessarily as a sort of protector, but as a good, decent human being. And that sort of sounds, uh, you know, not like high praise, but it is high praise to just ordinary folks that he just has a core goodness to him and a decency. You know, there is a video that's circulating online now of him comforting one of the families of one of the soldiers that was just killed. And this was a black family in Georgia, I believe. And just the humanity and the connection and the sense of heart and understanding and empathy that he displays almost more than any politician I can think of in recent history. It's almost pastoral. I think that goes a long way with African-Americans. It isn't that he's going to sort of stand between Donald Trump, stand between the racists and protect African-Americans. But there is a sense, I think, that African-Americans do feel like his heart is in the right place that he understands African-Americans and that he's on the side of African-Americans. And he's trying to, you know, go to South Carolina and say, you had my back back in 2020 and I'm going to have your back as well. So I do think that goes a long way. And also, I think they're going to remind people that he was Obama's vice president. 
right? He was loyal to Obama. I remember in 2020 hearing so many Black people talk about that, right? The idea that here he was, the right-hand man to America's first Black president, and it was, you were loyal to Obama, we're going to stand by you and be loyal to you, Joe Biden. So listen, before I came on with you today, I was thinking, you know, Maybe they should give some sort of joint interview on 60 Minutes, right? It's sort of a, well, you know. I'm sure watches. they will do some yeah, of that, right? Or yeah, joint yeah. appearances. It's just such I think a, that's right. a strength they both can play to. Mm-hmm. And he was a model vice president for Obama. You know, he filled the role the way you'd want a vice president to fill it. They, I think, developed a friendship unexpectedly during that presidency because there was hostility in the beginning. You know, one other sort of broad category, and I think of this as, you know, a Democratic problem more generally, and not Biden specifically, but is, you know, the idea of broad investment in black communities, whether it's education or infrastructure or small business loans, healthcare, an array of different investments that will make communities independent and thriving. And when I sometimes think of this issue of promises broken or promises not kept, it is the historical legacy of the Democrats that they have tried to deliver some of those solutions to black communities. And is that a thing that hangs over this as well for the black community? Or do you think there's other things that are front of mind for black voters? Meaning the failure to deliver or at least the sort of effort to deliver. I think that's right. I think that's, yes. And this will also be a way that I think Republicans will try to dissuade Black people from voting or actually have Black people vote for Republicans. The idea that, listen, you've been giving your votes to Democrats for all these generations in many ways. And what have they done? What do your schools look like? What are your communities look like? They're still under investment in education and in infrastructure. And so I think, yes, that is something that you hear. But then I think (laughs) there's a choice here, right? Democrats say they want to do better. Oftentimes they can't for any number of reasons. Often that is Republicans being obstructionists. And then there are Republicans, right, who don't even really have any ideas for improvement and investment in these African-American communities. What does Biden always say? Don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And so I think that's the argument they'll make. But listen, again, I think it goes back to some of that discontent around Obama. There's so much hope invested in Obama, so much hope invested in Joe Biden. And then when you get down to it, materially, a lot of these communities haven't changed, even though, listen, the unemployment rate is record low among African-Americans. Child poverty is on the decline, more investments in HBCUs. So they do have something to talk about. And listen, I live in a fairly diverse working class-ish area. and In Washington, D.C. Yeah. And, and sometimes I'm like, you know, I go into Marshalls and Target. It's packed, right? It's packed with folks who are buying all sorts of things they don't need, particularly from Marshalls. And so I do think there is a sense that, and you see some of this in the consumer confidence numbers, that the economy is People are starting to sort of feel it and that it's better than they thought. And so those things, I think, will matter as well. All right, let's take another quick break right there, Nia, and then we will come back and continue this very interesting conversation. I'm back and having a great conversation with Nia Malika Henderson, a political columnist with Bloomberg Opinion. We're talking about Black voters and the 2024 election. I wanted to talk about mobilizing. We've touched on it on and off. I was intrigued both by Ohio and Virginia this year where similar, you know, there were differences, but issues came up before voters around abortion, access to reproductive health care, reproductive rights. Governors of both of those states were trying to impose much more restrictive measures around abortion. And black voters got busy. And they really got activated around that issue and were pivotal in both states in not only turning back those policies, but in Virginia's case, actually establishing a majority in the state legislature. Clearly, people were paying attention to the issue. Clearly, people got around those voters and made it happen. And it does offer an example of what can be done at this microcosmic local level with the right issue and the right organization. And you get both great policy results and you get a good political outcome if you're a Democrat. Is that something the Democrats could mobilize nationally between now and November, finding those themes and turning the voters out? 
Yeah, and obviously abortion is going to be a huge issue. You have Kamala Harris taking the lead on that, framing it as a matter of rights and freedom and equality. And we've seen every time it's either sort of the pro-choice or pro-life movement in these different states, in some red states, as you mentioned, Ohio, for instance, the pro-choice side has won. So you've got some efforts by Democratic activists women's rights activists trying to put some of these ballot measures in states to galvanize voters. You know, Democrats didn't want to talk about abortion for years and years and years, and now they found their voice on it. A lot of that has to do with Kamala Harris, as I mentioned. And just this idea, you know, she gave a speech about two weeks ago, this idea that who do these people think they are, right? There's a kind of anger and righteous indignation. I think that African-Americans, women in particular, feel this idea that America now is less free because of the fall of Roe in some of these states that have very restrictive abortion laws, anti-abortion laws, that America is less free now than it was in the Roe v. Wade era. So, you know, you look at that, and I think for African-Americans who have been on the front lines of expanding rights, this idea that you're going backwards in terms of the kind of rights that Americans enjoy, it is an issue that I think is going to come up a lot and it will be effective for Democrats to argue around that. And I think it's going to be the centerpiece of what Democrats do in terms of mobilizing voters. You know, in the context of all that, I just want to like briefly touch on your own journey because I find it both, I'll embarrass you, but I find it both admirable and inspiring. You're a native of South Carolina. You went to Duke. You graduated cum laude. You got graduate degrees from Yale and Columbia and then a string of of high-profile journalism jobs, Politico, The Washington Post, CNN, and now you're stuck with me, at Bloomberg (laughs) Opinion. And you wrote, uh, I'll embarrass you further by reading your own words to you, but you wrote a beautiful column about Black History Month. And you're also a mother, I should add, because that's relevant to that. You know, you're a successful Black woman, you're a successful mother, you're a successful professional in a world that can line up against that in so many different ways. And you're writing about the relevancy and utility of Black History Month. And you wrote, across the country, at colleges and corporations, diversity and inclusion initiatives are being targeted, as are Black academics. Black books are among the most banned. The post-George Floyd racial reckoning faced a huge backlash and never quite materialized for any sustained period of time. Sure, there are now bandages that match the skin of Black people. Imagine that. And Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben are no more. But is that all? And then you go on in this very poignant, beautifully written column to talk about, well, you look at your daughter and you look at her world compared to yours and that there's things in her world you didn't have growing up and you had things your mother didn't have. Yeah. And you have some optimism baked into that. I wonder, do you think that that optimism translates into the political process for enough black voters these days? That's an excellent question. Listen, I think optimism is at the core of the African-American experience, right? This imagining of a world that didn't exist and fighting for that world. You know, it's our heritage. I mean, I grew up with parents who, my father in particular, as a young man, marched with Dr. King. It wasn't, you know, there were a series of marches around Bloody Sunday. I think there were three altogether. He was at the second one. So on Martin Luther King Day, I was able to show my daughter a picture of her grandfather, who is no longer with us, standing on the steps of Brown AME Chapel with Martin Luther King sort of over his shoulder. And I'm also, obviously, I'm a woman, I'm Black, I'm also a lesbian, right? And so to see the trajectory of the country go from being very hostile to same-sex marriage to myself being married to a woman and having a beautiful daughter, I am definitely somebody who... I'm a prisoner of hope, for lack of a better phrase. (laughs) And sometimes I feel, you know, naive after I I wrote that column. I was sort of thinking of my academic friends. They were like, oh, they're going to read this and be like, oh, she's very naive. But in so many ways, I kind of wrote that for my mom, right? Somebody who 
She was born in 1938. She was born in Chicago, saw the civil rights movement, women's rights movement, had four kids, and really tried to create a Black world, right? And Black pride in her kids and did it in the best way she could. But she also wanted it for my friends and neighbors who lived in houses nearby. And the Black books she had, she would often go and read to kids at school. And so now here I am very easily being able to kind of cultivate a Black life for my kid with Black books and the Black History Museum, which she's gone to a couple of times already, and Black dolls and Black Panther. And it really is amazing to see that kind of journey just in my own life. And partly, I think we have to be optimistic to honor people who have fought for where we are now, right? To sort of discount the progress is to discount the movement, discount the activists who push for this reality we live in now. Listen, are things perfect? Absolutely not. Is there more work to be done? Absolutely. But I myself can just say someone who was closeted in college and in high school and who is now living as an openly gay Black woman and working in what is really my dream job, Tim. I think I told you that. (laughs) I'm so happy that it is. Yeah. You know, this idea in kind of political discourse, people often kind of think of African Americans as not being patriotic, right? And often I see Black people have pushed this country to really live up to its ideals, right? And so in in that way, you know, politically, I think if you're somebody like Joe Biden, you're the Democrats, you're trying to connect that struggle, right? He goes to Mother Emanuel as one of his first speeches where those nine African-Americans were killed by white supremacists. And talks about that history, talks about white supremacy, and then talks about advancement, too, and some of the deliverables of his administration and this idea that, you know, just the struggle continues. So, listen, we'll see what African-Americans do in terms of coming out to vote. I, I, I will also say this. I think every cycle I've covered it is the exact same story. Black voters, are they going to turn out? They, I mean, literally even Obama, right? Obama, by the time he was standing for re-election, had come out for same-sex marriage. And there are all these stories about, is this going to hamper his ability to get African-American voters to turn out for him? Obviously, it did not. And so this is, listen, if you go back <laughs> every election, there is this question, and we'll just see how it turns out. You mentioned Kamala Harris earlier. You mentioned Biden talking directly to black voters and the aspirations and dreams you had as a person. And I always think in these elections about connecting hopes and dreams to the practical battle on the streets of the hard work of winning votes. And we could do a whole episode about Kamala Harris, and I'm going to avoid that here because we'd go on and on, but only in the context of whether or not the Democratic Party is good at recruiting training and getting exposure for candidates of color, black candidates or or any candidate of color. And I think one of the mysteries to me is I think the Republicans are very good structurally at messaging, recruitment and talent development. I think some of the talents they develop have become a freak show, but that's the direction they chose to do some of their talent development. But is the Democratic Party structured in a way now where it is recruiting bright prospects and getting them the training and exposure they need to be great candidates. I'm assuming you're meaning African-American candidates, right? Yes. Listen, I think the big barrier to that is America, right? It's sort of the anti-Blackness that is part of our heritage as Americans. It is incredibly hard for an African-American mayor in Birmingham, Alabama, or Tuskegee, Alabama, to go on and win that state statewide, right, because of racism, quite frankly. There have been moments, I remember post-Obama, Gwen Ifill, who I'm sure you knew, wrote a great book that really was this idea that there were going to be these other candidates in the wake of Obama that would reach heights in American politics. Kamala Harris was one of them. I think checkmark, the prediction there was a good one. But a lot of those folks in that book just couldn't breakthrough, right? Breakthrough from going to Congress to, you know, the House to the Senate, for instance, from a mayoral position to a higher position. So I don't even know that it's the Democratic Party's fault. I think the Democratic Party is faced with 
the reality that it's just hard to break through these kind of barriers that limit Black aspiration in other areas do the same thing in the political arena. You know, now you think about the mayor or the governor, I should say, of Maryland, Wes Moore. Can he go anywhere, right, beyond that? Is there a next Obama, for instance? Because I think that's sort of at the root of it, right? (laughs) Who is the next Obama? I wrote a story years ago when I was at the Washington Post, and the title was something like, Who is the next Obama? Nobody. (laughs) Um, Because of just the cynicism, I think, around how do you get a Black candidate who's able to be as gifted as somebody as Obama was, who can resonate with white voters and Black voters and Latino voters. Listen, I would admit that now, and I would say I think one of the most gifted Black politicians on the scene now is Raphael Warnock Mm -hmm. in Georgia, Mm -hmm. the senator of Georgia, who's able to do this amazing thing, which has become senator of Georgia over and over again. And so I think he has this real great combination of just being able to relate to regular folks of all stripes in Georgia and then the sort of power of his oration. He obviously has a background in divinity and preaching. So we'll see. In watching this election, this election cycle this year, what are you learning that you didn't know before? What has the big aha been for you thus far? Mm -hmm. I am constantly amazed at how engaged voters are. I mean, in some ways, this sounds like a cliche, but I think voters are catching on to the stakes, right? And I think part of that was what they saw in 2016, right? And so you see this sort of level of engagement with the candidates, with policy in a way that I think always surprises me in talking to voters. I did a, I listened to a focus group of Trump to Biden voters, and they had been paying attention not only to the sort of gaffes of Donald Trump or Joe Biden, but, you know, kind of policy issues, right? And so I think it's partly because people saw what happened with Donald Trump. People saw what that meant for foreign policy, for the Supreme Court, for any number of policy issues. And so now they're engaged in a way that they weren't before. I think the Georgia elections also showed that. And so, you know, when I hear people say, oh, voters might stay home and they're not going to be enthused, I tend to think they will be, given the past couple of of elections that we've seen, the past few cycles post-2016, you do see, I think, a level of engagement. And if not enthusiasm, but at least a recognition that Every vote counts because we've seen many elections where it's come down to the very, very margins. And I think 2024 is going to be the exact same way. We're out of time, Nia. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much, Tim. This was great. Nia Malika Henderson is a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion. You can find her columns on the Bloomberg Opinion website and the Bloomberg Terminal. You can also find her on Twitter at Nia Malika H. Here at Crash Course, we believe that collisions can be messy, impressive, challenging, surprising, and always instructive. In today's Crash Course, I learned that there might be more hope for Black turnout in the 2024 election than I previously believed, but I'm also a cynic, so I'm going to adopt a wait-and-see attitude. What did you learn? We'd love to hear from you. You can tweet at the Bloomberg Opinion handle, at Opinion, or me, at Tim O'Brien, using the hashtag Bloomberg Crash Course. You can also subscribe to our show wherever you're listening right now and leave us a review. It helps more people find the show. This episode was produced by the indispensable and highly motivated Anna Mazarakis and me. Our supervising producer is Magnus Hendrickson, and we had editing help from Sage Bauman, Jeff Grocott, Mike Nietzsche, and Christine vanden Bylard. Blake Maples is our sound engineering, and our original theme song was composed by Luis Guerra. I'm Tim O'Brien. We'll be back next week with another Crash Course.